chat. So yeah, I'll kind of run through the slides. So my name's Tom Parsons. Um, I think I've been involved with Ken for quite a while. Um, I used to work at um, BAE Systems and Airbus um, quite a while ago and involved in Ken there. Um, since then I've worked, I guess, um, so university research role, um, also in some teaching and stuff on research data. Um, at the moment I'm basically a co-director of a uh, spotlight data and we're a kind of AI and company based in Nottingham. Uh, we're based on the Nottingham University campus um, and we kind of specialize I guess in applying research so kind of data data analysis and AI research into organizations. Um, my background basically PhD in um, so I'm pretty much a special if that makes sense I pretty much do loads and loads of different things um, and yeah worked across um, mainly around aerospace and defense but my life I was basically working in pharmaceuticals so yeah pretty wide kind of breadth of stuff and really I kind of specialize in this uh, deploying research in organizations so some of our customers at the moment um, so we do work with Deloitte um, we work with a lot and I'll show you some of the stuff that we've particularly worked with the MOD the more kind of practical side of how we can use things like AI and machine learning so the first thing basically so really just any questions put them in the um, in the chat and we're gonna do some polls as well so I've got a, um, about three or basically multi-choice um, and some free text questions as well and they'll be appearing throughout the um, throughout the talk but yeah the main my main kind of goal today is to give you an intro and then show you okay this is what's being done in other places and see whether you can take some of that home to your current organization so AI so this is um yeah it depends on what who you what you read basically so it's the future it's going to basically change everything it's going to take our jobs it may create some jobs um, Going to make our lives easier and yeah it's going to beat us at everything and then eventually it's going to do a kind of skynet terminator style and rule over us so this there is this enormous breadth of just ai is a kind of like a, a fully do everything for us through to something that can just simply do one task and there is this enormous range. So what I'm going to do is basically talk about where we are now, really. I'm not going to go into the kind of science sci-fi stuff and where we could be in 20 years. It's basically more about kind of now. Um, so AI. So here's a definition that pretty much seems to make sense. So AI is a branch of computer science and it's seeking to replicate human intelligence in a machine. So, really, so basically the machines can perform tasks that typically require a human. So going beyond something like a simple rule-based system, it's actually getting a bit more intelligence. And another quote basically which I quite like, so basically make machines emulate human-like functioning. So you're effectively teaching something to do a job and to do that job on a kind of daily basis. Same as we do when we kind of go to work and we do our um, So kind of typical stuff typical areas that AI is being used for, so things like planning, um, working out basically delivery schedules, so like Uber, um, where the taxi can be, all of that basically is very, very driven by machine learning and data analysis. Uh, learning, so learning how to recognize things, learning how to make a decision, um, and then things like problem solving as well. So specific areas, say mathematics, people may be using it to um, solve problems and I'll talk about the kind of COVID situation as well at the moment. AI now is is typically doing a task. So you'd say so things like driving a car. It's a very complicated task when you break it down, but it is still a task. So it's basically so human beings usually drive a car, which kind of teaching a machine to do that. Recommend the film. So previously it would be on reviews or word of mouth. Now, when you go onto Netflix or Amazon, it's basically going to recommend stuff that you like. And you'll see on Netflix a kind of probability match or percentage match of how close they reckon this particular series or program is to what you like. 
and it's effectively learning about you as you watch stuff and as you do stuff same as spotify if anyone uses that um, or to predict an outcome some of the stuff i'll talk about but something where you've got something that's very very complicated and loads of different variables and stuff going on this is where you can use ai for um, so there's different types of ai so the three main types basically artificial narrow intelligence um, so narrow range of abilities pretty much task-based general intelligence which is where you're kind of going to a human level um, and then super intelligence which basically like skynet stuff which is more capable than a human um, luckily we are definitely at the first one at the moment um, we're certainly there so a lot of you will have probably heard of this hype cycle. Um, we're basically at the point where it's artificial narrow intelligence. So machines being trained to do specific things, so it's like voice assistants. Um, so your Siri, your Google Assistant, that will um, actually mine's probably going to go off because it's in the same room. Um, or chatbots. Um, so image recognition of cancers are some um, an example of image recognition on the left facial recognition some of you may have like nest thermostats which are learning your schedule learning your which or the best basically way to set the temperature in your house but specifically kind of one thing or a, a range of things well um, artificial general intelligence which is the second is it's kind of widely noised to be basically decades away research is being done into this this is basically where it would be on par with a human. Um, and I guess you've all seen the kind of Gartner cycles before. So this is the hype cycle for AI, uh, just from a, a recent report by them. Uh, so the stuff in the um, the orange dots are basically more than 10 years away. So things like autonomous vehicles, even though they're being tested now for the mainstream use, they're probably just a decade away. Um, and things like quantum computing. But then you start to say, okay, what's gonna be around in about two to five years? Things like um, computer vision, um, machine learning, this is all stuff that's basically available now and it's gonna become, and chatbots is gonna become more and more part of our life. And things which are already with, we're already dealing with, um, so speech recognition and use of basically specialist hardware such as um, GPUs that's already stuff which is happening on a kind of daily basis so you can see how quick this this stuff is actually moving um, so just to kind of give you an example basically of AI so autonomous cars so self-driving cars typically thought of as a basically um, something which is effectively AI but actually it's a collection of um, something called machine learning systems so what you're doing, you're basically breaking the task of driving a car down into subcomponents, so subsystems. So things like visual input, when you drive a car, you're looking at the lane, you're looking for other vehicles, pedestrians. You're also looking at things like signs and hazards. Um, as a human, you're basically looking at where you're going, so you're doing the steering, um, speed you're driving as well, hopefully. Um, and then you're also you're kind of monitoring things like, okay, has the, has the car got enough petrol? Has the, uh, is there oil in it basically um, and what's kind of going on around it so from a machine point of view this is an image from um, nvidia and you can kind of start to see okay this is what basically the machine is looking at so each of these different effectively boxes i don't know if you can see my cursor basically but so the box around the um the blue boxes are picking up cars there's a green um, line which is showing the lane that the, um, the car is currently in. You've got things like signs in red, pedestrians, so they're being identified in um, yellow. And each one of those boxes, basically, there's an algorithm, the machine learning algorithm behind that's been trained to recognize something. So the blue stuff is trained to recognize cars, vehicles, trucks. The yellow stuff is people. And the red thing is basically identifying signs. So that we're looking for information within that sign. So in there, the machine sees a sign, um, does optical character recognition, picks out things like speed limits, which is basically 25. That then goes into the system, the car adjusts itself and also adjusts steering, depending on what's going on around it. So really it's a collection of systems which are working together. Um, and this is pretty much where we are now. So 
the idea is basically that so machine learning is behind most of the stuff that you're seeing at the moment um, and that is this ability to basically teach a computer without being explicitly programmed so i mean most of you i guess are going to be um, familiar with um the kind of rule-based systems where you'll say so if a if um, a equals two then do something basically that sort of thing and that's what kind of rule-based systems kind of evolved this is basically teaching something to do something without having to explicitly code it um, so things like that basically machine learning is pretty much everywhere every phone you use um, you know google search results are, are done by that cortana um, if you use facebook basically it's the thing that's basically tagging you and your friends and recommending things to you and it's also basically allows you to because it asks questions of where do i buy a coffee and uh, all that sort of stuff um, the little kind of graph at the bottom is kind of a, a way of showing its accuracy at the moment so in terms of speech recognition um, this is from 2017 uh, it was already as accurate as a, as a, a human and it's getting kind of more accurate in terms of vision based in terms of recognizing stuff it was um already on par actually beyond beyond what a human can do and so this is it's effectively stuff that you can use to make sense of things and if i go to the next pretty complicated slide um machine learning has a a kind of wide range of things um i'm going to get come some of the kind of like more specific examples not at a technical level but at a kind of general level um, so things like supervised learning is basically where you give effectively the, um, the machine learning algorithm already characterized stuff uh, categorized stuff and it then decides whether something new is in that category um, and that's been used for things like image classification um, uh, categorization of text and i'll go into a bit on that and then there's unsupervised learning basically where you're asking the machine to find patterns in your data and that's so when you've basically simply got too much data and you want to kind of understand it this this will basically pick out things there um, and then there's kind of reinforcement learning which you've probably heard of um google ai beat, um, beating was it someone at go um yeah that was this reinforcement where you're basically the machine learns an, opt an optimum route so basically it gets it wrong it goes back tries again and it learns the best way to do something so the next kind of so one of the first thing is basically image recognition um, those of you some of you may be involved in things like image recognition i saw some of the chats people mentioning potential for that um, so the first thing is your kind of face recognition um, there's you basically train a model to recognize faces and emotions and maybe not during this talk but basically there's a link in there which will give you which goes to a basically a webcam um, enables thing which basically will recognize your um, recognize your emotion on your face and if you've got kids who are bored in this lockdown it's a brilliant way to entertain them so yeah um, but it's basically the thing that's so if you've got a, a phone which unlocks when it looks when you look at it that's effectively what you've got you've got machine learning model which is learning your face and learning how to basically um, and then doing something so here's a kind of um here's from something we we're involved in basically so we we're asked to kind of train a classifier and um yeah we started off a picture of um theresa may um, if you run through all of the politicians of, in Europe, basically, you actually get quite a close match between Tomei and Angela Merkel. Um, so it's it's not the most accurate, basically, but it's it's getting there. So things like if you want to rec uh, recognize well-known things, all these models are out there. So that's basically you put a picture of a submarine and it gives you kind of like 98% confidence that it's right. But it also thinks it could be a killer whale as well, just a tiny percentage, but yeah so it's it's not kind of foolproof but it is pretty accurate um some kind of real world stuff that's going on at the moment um this is something i found from uh, linkedin a few days ago so they're using the techniques that same things as the cars using as the face recognition stuff's using and looking at social distancing so here's a high street in the uk um, and they're actually using kind of ai techniques first to recognize people and then to basically draw distances between them and the people in the red are the people who are basically not socially distancing as such um, and then a kind of more tangible example um, so computer vision where they're basically looking at construction workers 
and um, highlighting things where, so this person isn't wearing gloves when they're you know, on, on a construction site. So this is kind of stuff that's possible. The, the next slide is something we're quite heavily involved in is basically categorizing stuff. So this is where you would effectively feed a machine learning model um, loads and loads of different text and say it could be on technology, sports, entertainment. And then when you feed it something again, it will then categorize that text. And I'll give you an example of where that's useful. So the um, pretty much all of you probably heard of um, IBM Watson, I guess, uh, may have seen presentations on it um, and some of its kind of capabilities. But we, well, I guess we do a lot of kind of text, text analysis and natural language processing. So I'll, I'll give you an example of okay, what, um, what kind of stuff um, IBM Watson would do. So I posted, I copied and pasted the um, text from the talk today into basically IBM Watson's kind of online demo, which is linked to the bottom. And just kind of say, okay, what, what's it gonna make of this? So, so if I look at some of the results, so I'm hoping this is what it's doing basically, but it's kind of, it's basically said, okay, this is about um, homework, it's about studying business, computers, internet uh, technology, business software. So it's it's pretty accurate basically. And there's things like concepts, it understood it's about knowledge, design, so it picked up design thinking, understanding, creativity. Um, and even without knowing anything about that text, basically, it's picked out the kind of highlights of it. Um, and also is a thing called natural language processing, which you can use to identify things within that text. So here it's found, so Warwick Business School is an organization, me, I'm a person. Uh, UK's location, it thinks AI is a person as well, but luckily, well, pretty confident it is, but, um, and Erica has also been picked out as a person. Um, and then you have the kind of, um, the emotions um, around each piece of text. So it's all a very positive document. So it's basically a marketing document. Um, and it's put me and Erica as very positive, which is good. Um, but yeah, so, so what you can do basically is to use things like this to, understand documents and rather than someone having to read through the entire thing you can actually start categorizing documents and if you've got tons and tons of documents on like sharepoint or onedrive you can basically say okay well i can categorize these things without actually having to physically read them um, and that's what's kind of useful for this sort of thing um, so other things which use natural language processing are chatbots um, and these are going to become more and more and more um, pretty much everywhere. You probably already use them if you do any banking um, and you may use you as a person on the end, but it's going to be more and more kind of um, AI based ones, which effectively are using natural language processing to understand a range of um, text. So this could be um, so queries coming in, so queries could be from like Twitter, it could be customers saying things like, okay, what, what's, um, how do I fix this? Or emails coming in. The NLP layer basically picks out things like the, the people being mentioned, the things being mentioned, and then it queries effectively knowledge base and data and then gives you back um, an answer. So that's the kind of things that are being used for. So if you have existing data sources, they, they can potentially be a layer which will add, allow your users to basically query them. Um, another use of NLP is recommendation engines. And this is, yeah, something that's basically going to recommend you stuff to buy in Amazon or, you know, LinkedIn is very, very heavily focused on this. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, um, so what you have, um, you, when you have a recommendation system, so in this example, it's basically so one from Amazon. So if I was one of the people, it would know what I'd purchased. It would also know who else has purchased that. Um, and it would also basically say, okay, well, yeah, you purchased this product, so you're likely to be interested in sport. Um, and here's some other kind of sport related stuff, which you're probably interested in. You can use these for expert finders. Um, so it wouldn't just be recommending a product, or, um, it would actually be useful for doing um, for people. So in Airbus, we used to have a thing called Yellow Pages, um, but this is effectively automating that process where you would give the um, base of the recommendation engine a load of text about that person. It then recommends stuff. 
similar people or similar things to, um, for you to look at. Um, and you may have come across this thing called a graph database. So this is um, this is effectively the things which are behind recommendation engines. What it is, it's, it's a lot of these things called nodes, basically. So in this example, um, we were involved in a kind of Kaggle competition where we we're mining kind of COVID stuff. So we mined the uh, literature around COVID. Um, and this is all kind of like 30,000 articles, I think. Um, so did basic natural language processing on it. Um, so found things like keywords, repeated sentences, um, and then put that into this kind of graph database, which allows you to search for things. So in this particular query, we, we basically search for things like basically around symptoms. So any, any particular uh, research paper that was mentioning symptoms, we were then basically pulling back the results and looking at okay, which ones are the most important. So things like cough was coming back, uh, sore throat, um, and then it was also bringing things. So like you can see like poor appetite. Um, so this is potentially very useful um, if you have the right data and you're, you have a lot of kind of text stuff. Um, so as kind of knowledge manager type people, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this. Um, so humans, particularly at work, just amass enormous amounts of stuff. Um, anyone who's kind of looked at any SharePoint sites in an organization or shared drives will, and been asked to find something on there will probably just go, oh God, can't do it. Um, so we were asked by the MOD to actually develop, to use machine learning to try and identify documents for them. Um, so the MOD have obviously different security classifications. Um, all of the stuff they generally there's stuff they they use is at official level which means that anyone basically could request that document and see it using a freedom of information request but they also have things like official sensitive um, which is stuff that contains sensitive information about maybe someone or about something basically um, and these are the things which are should be categorized by the people but maybe aren't um, and also things like records which are basically kind of things like meeting notes um, where you basically make a decision and then you um you show what that's effectively um, so we basically did a study um for them where this kind of we basically downloaded tons like literally thousands of documents because we obviously could get real MOD documents um, and we're asked to basically find find official sensitive documents so there's um, so as a human, if you were asked to do that, you would basically be given a SharePoint site and you'd have to look in every single document and then tag it to categorize it. If you you can effectively though get basically use a machine to do this and cut that down to literally minutes. So we um, we basically took all the text um, from the documents, things like PDF scans. Um, and then analyze that using natural language processing and then basically trained models, so machine learning models type in a neural network to identify types of documents. So on the left, you can see a document which is was official sensitive has now been released um, to the public. And then on the right, you basically see an example of a, um, a record, which is effective in the email chain, um, which is something that should be kept effectively. So th these are the kind of two different types of data if you if you then load that into this kind of graph database then what you start to see are kind of patterns within that so the pattern on the left is the kind of official data whereas the pattern on the right the cluster on the right of the um the, the image on the um on the left hand side is official sensitive data so you can start to see there's a kind of clear difference between what these documents contain um, and then you can really use unsupervised learning basically to also identify kind of um, clusters of stuff, clusters of information. But what that kind of project ended up with, um, which we've just done and hopefully getting follow on work for that, is really the end result was a, a kind of categorization of that file. So in the um, the first bullet point, you'll see basically a file called General Danet that was General Dan at CV, um, so it cor cor correctly identified it basically as something that obviously should be kept, and that it contained official sensitive information. Um, the Nottingham uh, P 
PDF was basically about meeting minutes. So it's correct, correctly said, oh yeah, this is something you need to keep. Um, also, and also that it was about um, you know, basically something that was a slightly sensitive. Um, we also did the same for Outlook as well. So perennial problem, people, thousands, thousands of emails, basically, how do you tag stuff? This basically mind SharePoint and email. So that's a kind of tangible example of kind of um, machine learning. Uh, you can also use it for things like finance. I'm not sure if anyone's in finance, but you guess the kind of some of the users you, I guess the use cases you hear at the moment. So people using it to predict prices, seek kind of correlations between things. Um, again, usually using kind of natural language processing and models to deal with huge amounts of data. Um, they're also using reinforcement learning to try and simulate trading best prices. Um, and there's some ridiculous stat that is, I think it's 80% of trades are now machine learning algorithms. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and also things like, okay, if you've got text data, you can actually mine that and then extract things like trends and insights. Um, and there's some links there to, um, to look up. So kind of something pretty topical. Um, so COVID again, so this, there's, there's a reason why I think there's a lot of stuff going on now um, to try and use AI. Um, one of the particular ways they're using it is for triage. So when someone presents with COVID symptoms, where do they go? Do they basically get, um, you know, do you say basically go back home or do you basically admit them to hospital? Um, and this is, they're using effectively training models from patient notes, sensor data, could be things like kind of heart rate, blood pressure, observation notes, and then using neural networks to predict an outcome. And this is effectively doing the job that the kind of the doctor or helping the doctor or the clinician when these patients first present. And I'm not sure if they're being used live yet, but this was an example from um, St. John Hopkins um, Hospital where I believe they're basically trialing this now. And again, this can help basically with the kind of the amount of people being kind of presenting. Um, so yeah, so I guess I haven't really looked at the, the kind of questions basically, but I'm guessing that some of you are kind of concerned about this and you're probably right to. Um, so typically AI is kind of black box. Kind of data goes in, um, answer comes out, pretty much no idea you know, how it made that answer. There's very little transparency, basically. Um, so how is Amazon or Google using your data? Pff, no idea. Um, and so this idea about user permissions, um, have we sought user permissions? Probably not. Um, and also this idea about just being too clever. So the, um, the comments on the right are from the social distancing base, you know, on that, the social distancing post. There's around 200 or something comments on on basically people pretty much objecting to their to something watching them and telling them they weren't doing social distancing. So someone's mentioned GDPR there, um, and also basically someone's actually quite rightly said, "Okay, how is this going to help the individual?" It's not flashing up that that person is too close. It's actually just monitoring them. So I guess. Sometimes you kind of think, okay, AI is just, it's almost like a solution waiting for a problem. Um, but it, it, it is getting there. So some of, yeah. some of the things you can, sorry, some of the things you can actually use. Um, Tom, can I, can are, I just interject there? Yeah. I, I think this might be a really good um, time to maybe send out one of our poll questions to the group, because there have been some comments on chat. But I hmm. think um, we had a poll question which was asking about um, how far do people trust AI? And I think yeah. the point you just raised yeah. there in that last slide. Um, so yeah. I think it would be interesting for the group. So um, Louise, could you um, post this so that um, all participants can see the mm. poll? Um, I think we're question uh, number three, do you trust AI? Um, and mm. all participants, you should then just be able to answer um, the questions um, as in yes, no, don't know, and then we'll be able to get a feel. There we go. So we've got, uh, hmm. got an online poll there. So if you can all just ch click your answers. Do you personally, do you trust AI? Yes, no, or don't know. And uh, Louise, once she knows she's had uh, everyone give their responses, we should be able to see on screen um, what the general feel is. I think maybe that can help to inform where you hmm. go with this next piece, Tom. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, so the... So some of the techniques you can use, you can actually 
get the base of the algorithms to show so in, um, show what they've used. So in the left hand example, this is effectively the text that the algorithm used to say that something was a record. Um, and on the right hand side, this is an example by Deloitte where they basically, so in the credit score, they've basically said, okay, these are the measures that we're using. So things like credit amount, age, purpose of it, all of these things are basically weighting the algorithms to say, yeah, this is definitely something that can be done or something not can be done. Um, and then very topical again, this, because I, I was looking at this thinking probably, yeah, this is probably one of the most important models ever to probably hit the UK. Um, so this is from Imperial, and this is the one that's basically um, causing us all to be virtual. Um, and it's the one that the government are using to base their um, lockdown model on. Um, so it's a Bayesian model, um, which I guess you can call a type of um, kind of machine learning. Um, and it's looking basically at all of the data from other countries and deciding um, where to basically, how to basically react to that. Um, so what they've done, they've put these model available on GitHub. Um, it's a, I think it's about a day behind or something, the one they're actually using, but this is the actual code they're using. And I think they've also released the data as well behind that. So other researchers, scientists can look at this and actually verify that there's no mistakes in this, because obviously, as you can see, the societal impact of this is just huge. Um, but this is effectively the model that is trying to reduce this um, the reproduction number of the virus and keep us all safe. Um, but yeah, so if you can do this, if you make your things transparent, then brilliant, it's all gonna really help. Um, so kind of one of the slides which definitely relates to that um, poll, do we actually trust AI? Um, so there's a kind of startup in California, I think it is called pony.ai. Um, they are basically using robo taxis to deliver stuff. And they obviously have the car safety driver um, who is basically the delivery person. Um, so if I go to the next slide, what you kind of see is a very, very fancy car with insane amounts of tech in it, huge amounts of processing power. And then the human has really been delegated to, to effectively just carrying parcels to a door and pressing the brake if it's not going in the right way, basically. So we have a kind of trust of AI, but not quite, so I'd say. Um, but the kind of, I guess the kind of final, few final slides. Um, yeah, so do we trust AI? Um, I think we have to. It's basically out there. Um, this is from 2016. So this is one of the um, ones looking at construction sites and just categorizing image. So a thousand images in under five minutes. Um, human experts, five hours. And the accuracy level was very similar. So this is something that we're going to have to live with and it's just going to get better and better and better. Um, so that's pretty much my kind of kind of my talk, the intro. Um, so in terms of like from a kind of KM innovation point of view, um, things that I know are useful at the moment. So natural language processing, text classification models, recommendation engines, chatbots, um, images, image recognition, um, could be safety related, could be kind of brand awareness, looking at what people are sharing on social media. Um, there's opportunities as well here. Um, we're involved in one, um, so just in a project with um, the Tony Blair Institute who were basically mining um, terrorism news um, to look at basically trends. Um, in, and then that was being used to basically inform policy. So in places like Africa. Um, yeah, so there's all of this kind of stuff. It's wherever you've basically got a human trying to doing a, a, a task that's vaguely repetitive, um, but with a degree of intelligence, this is where kind of machine learning can come in. Um, so things like mining research articles, looking across huge amounts of stuff. So the COVID study was across 30,000 data points, uh, 30,000 articles, which is absolutely no way a human could ever read all that stuff. Um, and then finally, um, yeah, in terms of recruitment, this is very much the future. Graduates now are expecting this stuff to be um, taken on board by organizations and they're expecting to work with it. And one of the slides, one of the examples I showed actually was written by a 16 year old. Um, so this is someone who's obviously, you know, into the tech and yeah, moving with stuff. So yeah, I guess that's it really. So any questions? 
Great. Okay, so um, I'm back live now. You can probably hear me. I don't know if people can see me at the moment. Um, so. Um, I know, uh, Eugenia, uh, you had a question. I'm just trying to find it now back in the chat, which was about um, machine to machine learning um it's you know do you when do you think that machines will start to learn from other machines and, and cut out the human components what are your thoughts on that tom um so we yeah we did something on that actually it was kind of interesting it was a um a study for government again um trying to find i guess nasty images on the internet uh, probably won't go into too much detail uh, but we we effectively trained um, I think it was around 13 or 15 machine learning classifiers. And then we put this other neural network across the top of it, which was basically learning from the results of other things and getting better and better and better. And um, yeah, it's not, I don't think it's far off. Um, there was a, I can remember last year, there was something about a, a kind of table booking service where you could, I think you could tell basically, uh, was it Google to ring up a restaurant and then book you a table or it was the other way around but I thought you know eventually you're going to have effectively a machine at one end a machine at the other you're just going to talk to your phone and that's going to completely cut out the human um, but yeah more and more and more I think the better these things get it's, it's just basically connecting the bits effectively um, so as long as you're talking a kind of common language uh, I don't know if, then it is possible. Yeah. OK, so uh, another question came in from uh, Ayusman and uh, his question was, do you think that artificial intelligence can help to improve the world scenario and to what extent? So that's quite a, uh, relevant to the current, but also I think generally in business, I think, you know, that there are a lot of expectations that artificial intelligence should be able to improve things. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that at all? Um, Yes, I, I do. Um, yeah, if you, I mean, if you take the COVID, um, so COVID stuff again, they're, they're basically using it to, to mine. Um, so, you, you know, when you're going to develop a, um, a drug, you're looking for kind of um, candidates, basically. So you're, and usually that process would take absolutely years, but they're using effectively AI to just kind of um, uh, to screen these um, candidate drugs which may interact with the um the proteins on the virus and that is you know it's taking days rather than years and years and years to come up with something which potentially um, can help save lives now um, i think so in healthcare i think it's got really big um, applications things like cancer diagnosis as well i think it's on par with what a radiologist will will do for things like um yeah finding breast cancer um, yeah so i think it's it's just finding the the applications and almost going a kind of task level based thing having the view that okay it's not going to be able to do multiple things but it will do a couple of things very very well and then build upon that yeah yeah okay and another a point raised by, by kim um she's saying you know not sure whether i can trust ai worried about hmm. how data can be used and I'm, and I'm you know anyone that works with data that works with uh, big data yeah will know that any statistics you know, they can they can be manipulated to say anything you want them to say but also the availability of data specifically personal data I think whether that's in our social lives or in our work lives so um yeah that, how worried should we be and are there uh, interventions being put in place to safeguard those kinds of things um it just I just saw actually some basically popped up voice replacing your radiologist a good thing it's not a good thing basically <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not it's um effectively it can i mean it it's basically it's it's really triaging stuff if it's radiology you probably do want a human looking at that but yeah but then if you are true if, if if the accuracy is proven to be better than a human who's tired and uh, like 200 slides to look at in a day or some ridiculous like that then you yeah it could be better um yeah data i, I think I mean, almost no one is reading terms and conditions because they're so they're so big. Um, LinkedIn is merrily mining your data. Um, yeah. WhatsApp. If I don't know if you ever if you've ever used WhatsApp and start and 
I had it open, you had a conversation with someone, I had a conversation about holidays one time and it started the next day I was getting holiday recommendations. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, so, so it is everything out there is using your data basically and by, by using anything you are effectively giving your entire life out there um, yes. just by using Google. Um, I don't, in terms of GDPR, um, I did read a study that it's making um, people think a bit more about, so particularly AI, how they how they using the people are producing an AI system. GDPR has made them at least think about what personal data they're using and the reason behind it, which I think is mm. very important. Um, and especially if you're looking at it in from an organisational point of view, if you're going to deploy it, um, certainly from that point of view, you want to make sure that people are aware of how it's being used. Um, yeah and the potential implications of that yeah and, and 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 i think it's fair to say uh you know you've mentioned there we tend to uh, not even notice that we're using it in our personal lives and no. yet uh, when we think about it in the workplace there's lots of resistance to it and, and yet yeah. it's everywhere already isn't it yeah so our um so our kind of a couple of our employees were kind of horrified that we could basically read their emails but it's actually in their terms and can't, you know they're using basically business um yeah yeah, they're using business kind of um, computers, laptops. Um, we use Gmail, but obviously we have admin access to all that stuff, so we could use it. And they're actually, when they sign the employment contract, they're actually signing that up. But we're also giving Google the right to actually mine away on all of that information yeah. and use it to improve their services. <laughs> so yeah. it's a kind of, it's almost a trade-off, basically, I think. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a, another question here from uh, Andrew to say, do you think that uh, artificial intelligence will enhance creativity or is there a danger that we won't question things because it will be a simple case of computer said yes or no? So um, I know we're going to move into design thinking, but what do you think in terms of artificial intelligence um, and creativity? I don't... I'm just kind of thinking from the, the kind of COVID point of view, where we basically, we have kind of, as a country and all over the world, we've basically agreed with a model. There's very few people have actually disagreed. Mm -hmm. There are some who kind of, um, I guess as a culture, we've basically accepted um, that the, basically the machine is right and we've not actually questioned it. So, you know, if you, I guess with the COVID stuff, you could actually question the underlying data, the accuracy of that. If you're, say so basically you know where's that data come from is there accurate statistics for you know people recording deaths properly and everything like that because that's i guess then a, a tangible thing um in terms of creativity i would hope it wouldn't stifle it um because i don't think it's got it's certainly not at the level where it's gonna start creating things for itself i believe um usually you're training off something um so things like there's a yeah yeah people are using in music now where they're basically training um models um to mm. kind of neural networks to basically artificially generate music which is based upon all the kind of stuff which is popular um and the, there was a track that kind of six music were playing quite often and it was it felt kind of right but it didn't feel quite right if that makes sense it wasn't yeah. quite right <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so the the, the formula for creating music using you know a, a melody yeah using a repetitive chorus doesn't necessarily come out quite right when, when you no i would say not at the moment um yeah. but the you know there are models for things like um enhancing photos which can take a really fuzzy photo and then effectively make it pixel sharp and that you would from as a human point of view you would go okay well that's that was the original image you would never know um, that yeah. that actually been through an algorithm. Um, yeah. Okay. So there, there's another question from uh, Evangenia. Uh, Tom, do you think that regulations will help with artificial intelligence ethics? And what's your personal definition of artificial intelligent ethics? <laughs> out there, written down any codes that you're following or? Um, I believe on the EU trying to introduce something around there. Um, there are there are kind of there is a AI code of ethics, which things like I think Microsoft, I believe, have signed up to, and there's kind of collaborations around that about what you would do with the data. Um, interestingly, so the, the kind of graph database that I showed before, where the kind of nodes are all joined up, um, 
Microsoft released one of I think it last year where they basically said anything you put in here we can use. Um, so I don't know the kind of, while well, they were basically building this thing. So I don't know if they'd really considered any ethics around that because if you put right. okay. personal data in there, then effectively you're granting Microsoft a, a, you know, an access to that. Um, so yeah, I think there are voluntary schemes, but I don't know if there's anything regulatory now, even in finance where I'm not I'm not entirely sure basically, but all of that is yeah high speed training yeah. basically. OK, and practical question from Jess. So mm. uh, she's saying yeah. obviously AI needs data. Um, and mm. this is something that we've discussed in one of our previous kit workshops that unless yeah. you've got good data, it's yeah. hard for the AI to mine it. So, you know, yeah. crap in, crap out. Um, and yeah. Jess has said, are there any suggestions on pr preparation before running an AI pilot um, on unstructured or uncleaned up data? Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so this is basically so this is kind of like our bread and butter really. Um, so what we um, in this, the SharePoint stuff I showed, what we did was extract um, effectively structured data from unstructured stuff. So like Word documents, PowerPoint, there are there are tools out there where you can send okay, a scan PDF and you get back the text. If you then analyze that using natural language processing, you get people, places. Um, so if you're trying to train a model like a classic machine learning model what you really want is a csv with columns in so if you're trying to categorize something you want a load of text and then you want a category so that could be things like official record or you know sports related um, so there are ways of actually extracting structured data from unstructured but your your best the best format you can possibly get is go to these csvs um that sort of structured column style data um right. is the best so we're doing a um a bit of project at the moment with um Southfield where we're looking at safety incidents um and they have a basically lessons learned database um which people put observations and actions in um and then we've taken um what was this csv and then training models to, to try and find trends within that Okay, we'll have one final question before we go to our yep. comfort break, because I'm sure people probably need a, a quick uh, stretch their yep. legs cup of tea before we move into the other uh, Tom section. Um, and this is just a, a, a quick question about what's the most innovative AI company which springs to mind when you hear disruptive? Um. <laughs> <Is that your>? <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. I wish it was. <laughs> what unicorn status. Um, that would be good. Um, I guess... I dare I say it like Uber, um, okay. Airbnb. Yeah. Um, yeah. They there's a phenomenal amount of stuff they they push out to um, to GitHub. All of their models, they you know mm -hmm. they they're basically continually pushing stuff out, um, and they don't need to. Um, but there's they're just basically making these tools available to the um to the rest of the world. Um, yeah. It's probably yeah. So you would think basically like a, I guess. A kind of taxi replacement app um, could actually make a big difference, but uh, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. definitely. They are they are, a, they are a really key disruptor. Maybe not so at the moment, but I'm assuming they'll be around for a while. <laughs> yeah. 